And we're also going to be talking about a, a very interesting uh, topic. It's video games and the effect they have on kids. And we're going to be chatting with Brent Stafford today. He did uh, a documentary called mm. Insert Coin, the culture of video game play. And, you know, it's a funny thing being a video game addict myself. I love to play games where you kill people. You fight people. Look at us both. Uh -huh. I know, I love video games. Yes. But I think I'm quite well adjusted. Some people might differ with me, but I don't know. Well, we grew up in a different world, though. We're going to talk about this uh, yep. a lot with Brent today you know because what? we, you know we what, grew up during, like, Pong was violent Every us, time right? I play Pong, Duke. I just want to kill somebody. Duke. Duke. Maybe Brent can solve that. Well, exactly. But we're going to talk about what the effects of violent video games are on young people today. A very interesting subject. And the and interesting cool thing about Brent Stafford is he, it, it's an SFU production. It was his master's thesis that he did insert coin for. But he also taught the next two guests because yes. they, uh, they did their own production called Generation mm -hmm. on Hold, which they, which they produced themselves. Rob Brownridge you, might Brownridge, you might recognize him from Generation Y right here on Rogers. And just to let you know, his hair is his natural color today. Yes. He's joined by his co-producer, Jason James, and uh, they, they did this production called Generation on Hold. And if you're looking at the footage right now, and you've you know, got an education, you might have found yourself working in one of the jobs that you're looking at right now. Yeah, everyone has had this. It's a very interesting time in the workforce right now. Uh, there's a whole new brand of prejudice, basically, that's based on age. You know, you have to have education inflation is what they call it. You have to have a BA to work at McDonald's now. Luckily, I never got a BA, so I managed to surpass that system somehow. We're going to be talking Good for uh, you, Mike. to Rob and Jason about that a Having little bit Having a lack today. of education is something to be proud of here on Dave. <laughs> dinosaur a uh, little bit that opens up this Friday. Take the kids to go see that one. And you know what? I might even go and see that one because it just looks pretty cool. I like the animation. I can't believe what they did with the animation of that. It's amazing it's almost stuff. what like, you'd see in some video games, Michael. Yes. How's that for a transition? Whoa. Right there. So smooth Thought like butter. Top of my head. His name is Brent Stafford, and he has made a documentary called Insert Coin, the culture of video game play. And he's here to talk a little bit more because you know what? They've come a long way, baby. Have they ever? They certainly have. Oh, yeah. Brent? Good. How are you guys doing? Good. We're doing great. And we are part of the Pong generation. Those yep. are the kind of video games that Michael and I grew up, but video games now, honestly, they look like that movie Dinosaur. The realism is incredible in some of the games you'll see. And can be quite frightening. Also, tell us a little bit about Insert Coin and, and what you're dealing with in the, in the documentary. Insert Coin is a one-hour documentary that I produced for my master's thesis in communications at SFU. That's a boy. Yes, yes, yes. So did you pass? Did <laughs> yes, I did pass. Right, cool, yeah, that's good. Yeah, to the chagrin of my colleagues, I'm sure. But <laughs> um, It's broken up into six blocks. Uh, it begins basically talking about the industry, the scope, how large it is, how big the business is. It deals with uh, the history of video games, straight from Pong mm -hmm. right to the top games today talks about how video games are made, so I'm at Electronic Arts and Nintendo. Block 4 is all about um, who the video game culture are, like who are these kids, why do they play, and video game advertising, which is key, I take a swipe at that. And Block 6, or 5, is video game violence, and Block 6 is addiction to video games in isolation. Now, you're talking a lot about kids of a certain age group, um, yes. because obviously this kind of stuff, to, to people like Fiona and I that were sort of playing our younger years with Atari and Asteroids and all these really kind of ghetto games. Right. Uh, it's very different from what kids that are like from 6 to 14 are growing up with now. What did you find in this? Like, does this stuff have, have an effect? Well, it's, it's a little problematic to talk about cause and effect, and obviously we're talking probably specifically about violent games here. But certainly you can, you, there is a correlation, because what happens with kids is when they, when they get absorbed into a game, it's such an intense emotional experience, and the realism, which is so heightened, it really sucks a kid in. And it's called the zone when they're there. And I've been there, right? been there. And, and you talk in the documentary about the physical reaction, like you actually yeah. measure sure, the physical, yeah. physical responses. Yeah, the ga galvanic playing. skin response, your heart rate, your brain waves, they all react differently to violent games. And what the research out of SFU found was that the more violent games you play, the less of a galvanic skin response and heart rate and stuff because you become physically desensitized to the experience of violence. So what is happening that we can say is that kids are being affected in some physical way yeah. when they're playing violent mm -hmm. games over an extended period of time. What's happening psychologically is a little is a little harder to measure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But certainly, you know, I, I say this to people that you look at something like the World Wrestling Federation and WWF and the exposure to that, you can see measurably on the school grounds that kids are <laughs> acting differently and more violent. So certainly I would think that spending 40 hours a week in front of a video game killing thousands and thousands of people is going to have some measurable effect yeah. in terms of your... Now that brings to question whether the kids are being are, are kids being des desensitized to the games because they know what's going to happen and after a while, well, you know, kids get bored of stuff, or do, are they really getting desensitized to the reality and the playgrounds and the violence and everything that we see? Well, <clears throat> your appreciation about killing, it, it changes, I think. And yeah, you become desensitized. 
you're desensitized within the game, and I think that our entire culture, which is so mediated by violence in our yeah. media, has played a, a large, huge role in creating a culture of violence um, among teenagers. And that, and that is, I think, kids don't quite understand the mm -hmm. consequences of their actions. And then it brings, uh, Mike and I were talking about this morning, it brings to mind parenting. I mean, yeah, exactly. some of the kids that you uh, talk about, in the talk to in the documentary, they, their parents are there too. They know their kids are playing Doom for eight hours a day, but hey, what can I do? In and the these room. kids are playing it at home. Now, you know, you're blaming the video game. S some people tend to blame the video games, but really parents come in to play for responsibility for this too. Absolutely, and it's really tough. I mean, parents need to take greater responsibility in monitoring what their children are playing. Absolutely. But we live in a society where parents are absolutely inundated with too many things to do in, yeah, yeah. in their day. And video games um, have become so integrated in children's culture. Mm -hmm. For one, they're used as a babysitter, too. Like There's no way you can keep them away yeah. from kids. Because ideologically, yeah. we're positioned as a, as a culture to believe that technology is a good thing. And video games are used as an indoctrination tool for young kids into the, high, the world of I was going to say, it's one of the first experiences that you get most times absolutely with the high-tech world is, sure. is staring at a video game. And, and many parents believe that that interaction with the computer and with video games has a beneficial impact in yeah. the end, even though there, there's trade-offs when it comes to the kind of content in the games. Yeah, I mean, there have been some studies that have shown that with certain games there are some benefits, you know, sure. hand-eye coordination, spatial yeah. relations, things like that. But, uh, you see, my whole thing with the parenting is, is, and we do this in my family, why have a computer in the kid's room? Like, there's no reason for a child to have a computer in his room. Put it somewhere where there's some supervision, you know, a moderate sense of that kind of stuff. I mean, that to me just seems like the crux of it. Like the video game, obviously they have to stop at some point. And there was a rating system for video games, wasn't there? Well, yeah, that's I mean, what happened in the early 90s is that the U.S. Senate got in a big uh, uproar over the game Mortal Kombat, which is so sanitary compared to today's standards yeah, of violent yeah. games. Mm -hmm. And in the end... I uh, love that game. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a good game. I know. <laughs> I mean, I like shoot 'em up games. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's tough, but... Well, there's a difference between doing something like that when you're 30 and, yeah. and, and going in it and sort of having a real solid foundation of understanding of, of what this yeah. is in, in realism versus when you're seven and you don't have all the mental structure to realize totally. that, hey, this is not real. Totally. And it, the key thing that I think people out there have to realize is that video games are no longer a toy. They are an extremely powerful communication medium that really mm -hmm. have usurped the power of all other traditional media because they pull the power of television in. They pull the power of film in. They and pull so everything real. in. And they're so real yeah. and that's that realism which yeah. which which we strive for as people to recreate the narrative of our, of our lives and to play god as programmers to create this fantasy world that's so intricate it, you just get a charge from it yeah. but in the end it's a very powerful communicative medium and we have to start looking at it that way instead of just a toy now you've made uh, this documentary it's your master's thesis uh, what are you planning to do with it now what's what's the intent <laughs> oh boy i've been trying to sell it no, this, this, been a tough this job. is where you get into another whole ball of wax because you're trying to sell it to commercial stations, which of course have the Nintendos, the EA Sports Absolutely. as their sponsors. Yeah. So. Well, that was the crux of the of the entire um, master's thesis, which the, the the product was the video games, but the thesis was all about producing. Um, a commercially broadcastable product that has a critical point of view right. and to then try to sell it. And, and can it be done? And can it be done? Can it be done, Brent? It's really tough to do I it. It's, I, it's gone like right up the food chain at some of the top distributors in the country and right back down again and they said because the Because you might be annoying large it. corporations who provide advertising dollars. Billions and billions of dollars this industry represents and the advertising revenue is absolutely huge. So there's a, and it's not even crit that critical. It's not yeah. like I, I, I come from the CBC, so there is some objectivity to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I mean, I take a swipe at them, but still in the end, the broadcasters are... What well, about too schools bad. and stuff? Uh, the scholastic system, just taking it into classrooms? I've got a meeting, actually, right after uh, this interview. Because that's where I think it would probably do even more mm -hmm. use than maybe being on a regular broadcast. Yeah, I'd like to get it out in the schools. Absolutely. Get the dialogue out there. Yeah. Well, cool. if you want to find out uh, more, hopefully you'll be able to see it on a TV station near you at some point. Very it is uh, great and educational. And yes, at this point, I think we're supposed to offer you a donut and remind you to buy coffee. For Tim Hortons. May 24th. May 24th for kids. You know, I love it when they do that. I'm talking about corporate sponsorship in there. Exactly. You know. We just slammed corporate. Have a donut. <laughs> no, it's for the kids. If you want to find out more about Insert Coin, you can check it out at twocoolproductions.com. Brent, thank you so much for coming Thanks, by Brent. today. We appreciate it. We're going to take a break right now. When we come back, we're going to have some great music with Howie Beck, all the way from Toronto. Be right back. Ornatus, Vancouver's true European skincare. Specialized over and around the world, please call Casablanca Floral Boutique at 685-2166.
<laughs> Welcome back to Daytime. I'm Michael Eckford. And I'm Fiona Forbes. And everybody's had a bad job, a retail job that's so redundant few. that you, well, you, you want to kill somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I have, and you probably have, I've too. I've had a few, yes. Uh, but two More people at SFU have. have made an interesting documentary on the subject. It's called Generation On Hold, and they're joining us now, Jason James and Rob Brownridge. Welcome to Daytime. Hey, Thank guys. You. How's it going? Good. Good. Rob, Good. your hair is its natural color. I've never seen it before, kid. Oh, well, yeah, it's been natural for quite a while. You know, nice. because I, I finished up school not too long ago and having to look for work all the time. Have been for work. to corporate America. <laughs> no, I haven't. Corporate Canada, one of the two. Uh, let's talk a little bit uh, uh, about Generation on Hold. Jason, maybe you can set it up and, and talk about what you guys talk about in the, in sure. the documentary. Sure. Uh, Generation on Hold is a half hour documentary we produced in our studies up at SFU. It's, uh, it's based on the book by James Cote and Anton Alahar, who are sociologists at the University of Western Ontario. Mm -hmm. And um, it deals with issues such as education, inflation, and underemployment in young people. Now, one thing that you guys touch on pretty early on in it is uh, the fact that to get a job, a high school diploma used to be a pretty good thing, a pretty great thing as a matter of fact. But now even people with university degrees, master's thesis are working at places like The Gap. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of people did you come across doing your interviews, Rob? Um, well, we ended up uh, focusing on three people, all very unique stories. Uh, one was a girl who had gone to a cook training school and was working